Hola, good morning, buenos dias. Uh, Sarah, Lori, and I are happy and honored to be with you today. Um, the makerspace at Miami University Libraries was officially launched in fall 2019. Um, that first semester was great. We had momentum. But then, of course, we know what happened in March 2020. So as we transition into a new normal, we're excited to report that our numbers for fall 2021 were three times higher than what we had in that first semester. And that's part of what we will share with you today. So uh, next slide, Sarah. So to start with today's presentation, um, let me go with kind of an overview or a bit of history about innovation and experiential learning in higher education. If we were to look for the definition of innovation, it will be something along the lines of the introduction of new things, new ideas, new ways of doing things. So people are always innovating. It's, it's a human nature to adapt and introduce new way of doing things. In a way, innovation is a way to respond to human needs. We need to innovate because of the ongoing changes in how we live, how we work, how we interact, how we learn. I'm sure you will agree that in the past, academic libraries were expected to provide quiet spaces for a type of learning that was important and effective at that time the idea of memorizing concepts. But learning has changed. In recent years, we have learned about the idea of active and experiential learning. We know that many of us learn better when we have active roles in the learning process. We learn better when we mix and combine theory and practice, when we make or create new things. So that could be a research paper with an infographic, a multimedia project, a 3D design, or maybe an interactive map powered with GIS. Other characteristics of, a, of experiential learning is that they support the idea of making or creating as part of the learning process. Of course, experiential learning is also about a collective or multidisciplinary approach, where a person is usually one of many involved in the process of making or creating something new. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Innovation and experiential learning is also important because it's directly related to the idea of new skills for the future workforce. In the time of artificial intelligence, machine learning, there is a serious debate about the type of jobs that will exist in the near future. This is where the idea of learning new things and new ways of thinking becomes important. The graphic on the right, it's about the responses from more than 10,000 young people who responded to a survey about soft skills that are important in today's economy. As we can see, all of those skills are part of what machines cannot still do. So for colleges and universities, it is super important to continue to provide the resources and programs that will help students uh, in the future workforce to develop those skills. For those of us in academic libraries, a framework that is uh, often used to talk about literacy is the ACRL framework for information literacy. But in many ways, the invention of the internet, along with the explosion of other communication tools, also forced us to think about other types of literacies. So think of data, health, financial, digital, et cetera. For some, it is all about the concept of digital competencies or digital fluency. We know the pace of change is accelerating. Many of the roles, skills, and job titles of tomorrow are unknown for us today. So how can organizations prepare for a future that few of us can define? How can, how can we attract, prepare, and keep working and joining forces to develop the future workforce. What should we tell the younger generations? Part of our message will have, to, will have to be to remind them about the need to focus on their ability to continuously adapt, engage with others in the process of solving 
real world problems in multidisciplinary teams. It is not just about acquiring new knowledge, but also about learning new things and new ways of thinking. And next slide, Sarah. So for academic libraries, it's all about providing students with diverse, inclusive, accessible, and resource-rich services and spaces that support their academic experience. The guiding principle for this work, it's about the role of academic libraries as the equalizers at our campuses. We hear that there are students who come with their own devices, maybe their own VR headsets. And while that's true for some, many do not. So in times of misinformation and different types of information sources, it is our responsibility to assist students with the discovery, critical evaluation, proper creation, and effective dissemination of what they create. Part of the strategy will be to continue to integrate and embed scholar resources into the teaching and learning plans. One of the things we've done at Miami is the creation of Canvas modules, which is often a package that takes care of one week of classes. A module comes with some reading materials, a quiz that will help the professor uh, customize the lecture, um, instructions for a hands-on activity, and a rubric for grading purposes. One indicator of success is the number of faculty who have asked us to further customize the modules for their classes. As we continue to support a culture of engagement and creativity, it's also important to provide the tools and resources that students need to create new knowledge. Examples will include smart and reconfigurable study and instruction spaces, inclusive and custom portals or apps that can help predict or suggest scholar resources for upcoming classes or uh, upcoming projects. Another key element for this work has to do with the ongoing mission to provide welcoming and immersive spaces for active and engaging learning. We believe XR, XR technologies will continue to reshape how we learn and how we experience the world. Two recent examples, a history student experiencing a VR application or a 360 video about the life of African-Americans in the DC area in the 1950s. She was like, this is real. Another example, a chemistry grad student visualizing, manipulating, modifying protein structures in a VR application. We think providing the right support for student needs and student success is not only important for current students, but it can also translate into an important element of decision-making for future students. When parents and prospective students come to our campus and they realize the type of service that we provide, as a parent of a college kid, I know how important that is. And that can be part of the decision-making. So with that in mind, let's now transition into a specific example of how a makerspace has and continues to make impact in the life of students at Miami University. Thank you. And to that, um, the Makerspace at King was founded after a entire library reorganization and we founded the Create and Innovate department. Um, to that, we set our mission to enhance scholarly work by anticipating the resources, technologies, spaces, and expertise that drive groundbreaking research, creative forms of expression, innovative tools for teaching, and new mediums for sharing our community's scholarly achievements. So. We're set to make a new department, and uh, this was in 2017. Uh, we fleshed out our department uh, considerably when we got our outreach librarian, which is Sarah Nagel. And through that, we started to be able to work with other you know, groups on campus. We weren't sure how to go about that. At first, we were part of a computer lab. We had the Center for Digital Scholarship as well, but the makerspace and experiential learning was something we wanted to focus on. Uh, to do so, we started out by taking it on the road. We did pop-ups across campus and we would take uh, a silhouette sticker cutter, a VR headset, uh, button makers, and some other technology and let students just have that no barriers experience, uh, you know, no no worries about you know doing it wrong. So we wanted to make sure the students were able just to touch things and get their hands on it and experience these things that you know are 
maybe they'll never come across in other capacities. So we, you know, we found that successful. It was good to take those across campus, but, you know, we had a stronger desire to make a more central location. And thanks to buy-in from our administration, we were able to take over some floor space in our library. Um, we're on the third floor and, uh, what was previously this, you know, a lot, very large Center for Digital Scholarship, and we uh, got to take over a little bit of that. And with some furniture that we took from across campus, we ended up with some tables that were previously used for dissections in one of the science buildings. Um, we set up with equipment that we were able to purchase thanks to uh, technology grants, student technology fee grants that we applied for within you know the university and. We made a makerspace and it was great. Uh, by 2019, we had fleshed out our staff with a creative technologist and it was it was ready to go. And we had started, we were gaining momentum. And uh, as with everyone else, we kind of hit March of 2020. <laughs> Next slide, Sarah. Sorry about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the mission and guiding principles behind the space before we go into um, closing for COVID, reopening, all of that, all of that fun stuff. Uh, so this is uh, this little blurb at the top is what we part of our um, explorational kind of um, planning for this space, and that is um, the makerspace is designed to give students the skills and experience in design, prototyping, and fabrication and provide access to hardware and software that students can use to turn a concept into reality. So we were really focusing with some of our foundational thinking on providing this uh, experience for students, providing access to the technology. A lot of those soft skills that Elias was talking about um, in the beginning of this, we knew that this was a way for students to really gain those skills. And as we've kind of developed over the last few years, we've also developed some guiding principles. And I wanna talk a little bit about those. Number one is low barrier of entry. We want to provide students with an accessible and approachable entry point to the technology tools and methods that we provide. And we think about this every time we purchase new equipment and tools and things like that. We always lean towards things that are as beginner friendly as possible and non intimidating. And we really see that as part of our mission is providing that in, you know, lack of intimidation, because sometimes that intimidation factor it can really keep students from exploring and learning new things. So that's something we think about a lot. Inclusivity is another cornerstone of our guiding principles. It's always been something that we've thought about from the very beginning. And part of that comes out of the fact that the maker movement, especially in the early days, historically had is issues with inclusivity. Um, the early movement, which was like mid 2000s to early 2010s, was overwhelmingly white, male, and high income. And that really does not encompass all of the making that happens in the world by, uh, by women, by, you know, the different ethnically and culturally diverse types of making that have always been happening. They weren't represented in the maker movement uh, from the beginning. There's been more progress in that area over the last decade or so. Um, so we're, we're working towards more inclusivity in maker spaces. And part of that comes out of more maker spaces opening in libraries, public libraries, school libraries, academic libraries, on college campuses and in other um, educational settings. So to counteract this history, it's really important for makerspace um, professionals to actively work to include and support historically underrepresented groups in our makerspaces and to work against any intimidation factor or just preconceived notions of who is a maker, who's welcome and who's embraced in a makerspace. So we have thought about inclusivity from the very beginning and we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about our hiring um, of student workers, of how we've uh, kind of tried to achieve that. Transdisciplinary collaboration is another thing that we um, have really tried to pursue. It's um, we want our space to be a crossroads where students can not only meet other students that are outside of their majors, but they can strike up conversations and even collaborate with other students and create these projects that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And uh, one thing that we do is we have a display case, right? When you come into our space with a variety of projects from all the different machinery and tools, and um, they represent different projects from 
various disciplines. So as soon as students walk in, hopefully they're seeing something that maybe applies to them and how they could apply this space to their discipline. And um, honestly, that's a big part of the argument for having maker spaces in the library on college campuses, because the library is already open to all students. Um, Miami, like many university campuses, has labs that are scattered throughout campus, different experiential learning, um, ideation, and then there's like things like 3D printing labs. But those are usually very particularly focused on a specific major or a specific group of students. Sometimes they have to even be taking a specific class to use those labs. And so that's how we knew that we weren't really going to overlap with other spaces on campus because we wanted to make a central kind of discipline neutral space for students. And all of that is based on that transdisciplinary collaboration. And another thing I think about a lot in terms of our guiding principles is this idea of liminal space. This comes from an article by Miller et al. And they make the observation that maker spaces on com college campuses exist in a liminal state um, because they are kind of informal learning spaces that fall outside of the structured university curriculum. They use the example of the Curtin Library makerspace in Australia, and they argue that makerspaces have great creative potential because of their locations at the tr kind of outskirts of that traditional university. And makerspaces do, and we do as well, uh, work alongside in collaboration with faculty teaching semester long courses. But we also offer students a place to kind of tinker, explore and play that falls outside of their normal courses. And I feel like we have achieved this kind of liminal space. It's a fun, creative, casual space that students sometimes maybe even feel like they're escaping from the structures of normal university life. So those are our guiding principles. Back to Lori for a sec. Uh, because of the space that we try to, we've strived to create, you know, the that inclusivity and making people feel welcome. When COVID came, we did not want to lose that. So the first thing we tried was uh, make alongs where we would have a zoom meeting and invite, you know, the public to, join us in making a craft with materials that they should be able to find at home, or they were welcome to pick up a kit that we would create, you know, here at the library and let them, you know, take as it was. And while this wasn't as success, it wasn't as successful as we would have liked, I think, you know, some folks had some Zoom burnout by this point. We, uh, you know, still strived and made, we did make some things and make some great, you know, connections in that regard. Um, but what developed most successfully for us, uh, through COVID closing was the maker kits that we have. Um, we have created kits. Uh, the first one came about because of a need for an AV kit. Uh, people wanted to be able to take their video out. You know, they needed an option to take it, which to check it out, I guess it's like a circulation material. And from that, we made a kit with backdrops and uh, ring lights and, you know, speakers and, we didn't stop there. We built uh, kits with sewing machines, vinyl cutters, uh, Lego Mindstorm kits, Arduinos that students can check out um, for you know, a week at a time and take all these materials home and do you know whatever they want <laughs> with those you know machines out of our space, which was a big step for us to let those kind of let that control kind of go and let students drive that need. And we've had great success with those kits. Uh, they're checked out almost constantly. And it's been a great success to come out of that, you know, closing. Uh, the eventual, eventually we were able to open uh, by appointment. This was great. We were glad to get our students back in our space, but it was very slow going. And, you know, based on the momentum that we had had before closing, we were concerned, uh, you know, just about the, the pace of getting our public because the collaboration part of our space is so important. And, you know, by having students come in, so limited that limited that social aspect that we, you know, cultivate here. So when August, 2021 hit, we hit the ground running. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our reopening. We were, it was about 18 months that we're, we were either fully closed or we were operating by appointment only. And, Finally, when fall 2021 came around, we were told we could kind of open things up a little bit more, obviously cosh, you know, with caution and a lot of safety protocols in, in place. We were just thrilled to switch back to a more open service model because like Lori said, that, that, that 
community that we build in the space we think is so important. And part of the reopening involved new machinery. During shutdown, we were able to obtain funding for some new equipment. We have an internal technology fee grant um, application process at Miami, and um, that's a yearly process. And we've gotten a lot of success getting funding for our makerspace equipment through that. Most notably, we obtained a Glowforge Plus laser cutter. So our first laser cutter that we've had in the space. And it quickly this past fall became one of our most popular machines. And it's being used for various classes from art to engineering to fashion design, and also just kind of gotten a lot of interest from individual students. We hired 10 new student workers for this past semester. Lori will talk a little bit more about our hiring strategy and that kind of thing. But um, it was really kind of, we had a lot of uh, students graduate at the end of the 2021 academic year. And this was an opportunity to kind of get a fresh start with a, a whole new batch of student workers. And, you know, we were honestly a bit concerned, like Lori said, about losing that momentum that we gained you know, in our first semester and a little bit more before we had to shut down for COVID. Uh, so we treated fall 2021 as kind of a grand reopening. You know, we did a lot of reaching out to existing and potential campus partners. We participated in several library and campus-wide events leading into the fall semester that targeted students and also faculty. And we leveraged our communications department to do some social media advertising. We sent flyers out to all of the dorms on campus. We really hit it hard last semester because we wanted to get back that momentum so badly. And we really think that all of these efforts paid off. Elias mentioned this before, but our first semester, which was fall 2019, we had about 350 bookings. And for us, we were like, that's a great success. You know, we're tucked away in the top corner of this big library. We don't have a lot of foot traffic. Just getting started out, we were thrilled with 350 bookings that semester. But this past semester, this past fall, we had over a thousand bookings. And uh, so up 300% from our first pre-COVID semester. And, you know, obviously we were thrilled and just relieved that we were successfully able to kind of jumpstart the space again after the halt of closing down for the pandemic. And as Sarah mentioned, we hired new students. Um, we did lose several students to graduation. Some students did not come back, you know, post-COVID. Uh, we really wanted to change up how we staffed our makerspace. And the, you know, Elias brought it up and it really, you know, hit home with me. We wanted to include DEI principles with our student hiring. Um, we wanted to make sure that the students who come into our space feel represented and see themselves uh, when they come in and, and feel included. So to do so, I really wanted to reach out to those students that are underrepresented. The our university, I'm sure several others have something called the hub where student organizations, you know, promote their events, but it also includes contact information for them. So I reached out to about 15 groups with, you know, our flyer, which had our a QR code for our employment listing, you know, and asked them if they, I, <laughs> I took the entire week, first week of classes, booked it off so I couldn't have any appointments and let them come in for pretty much open interviews. And we had a great response to that. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we partnered with many groups uh, in those first weeks and the LSAMP, the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, uh, we were able to uh, hire some students from that meeting. It was, and they're wonderful students. Our, our entire group is just incredible. And now we've got a staff of 14 and we've had <laughs> an interesting experience getting them hired. Um, I'm sure with every, as with so many other organizations, HR had issues, you know, getting restarted and a backlog with uh, student hires. It took a great deal of time to get everybody through the process. And in hindsight, that was actually a great thing because it allowed us to give individual attention to each hire. And by the time we, you know, got them suitably trained, they were training the next student who came. So everybody, you know, contributed to each new hire and it really gave us the opportunity just to, for that individual attention, which, you know, you don't always get. So this was exceptional to, you know, getting restarted with an entire makerspace focused staff. The 
my favorite part about training the students this year is uh, we started with aprons and somebody compared it to like a karate belt, but it, um, students that work in the space wear a gray apron and on that apron, we have them put something from every machine that they've learned. So from our Glowforge, they will cut out a wooden button that has a QR code for making appointments in the space. Uh, they'll for our silhouette machines, they'll do a vinyl, you know, heat transfer and add that to their apron. And it allows them to personalize it. So there's not something that they have to do specific to the space. They can make it their own. And that, you know, just increases their ownership of the space. Our students are, you know, just amazing. They have a discord where they talk to each other. There's a great, you know, sense of camaraderie that they've built. Um, a lot of them are first year students, which I, you know, I'm sure adds to the experience. We hope to keep them for the entire four years that they're here. And I just, I'm so fond of our, our kids are, they're just really good students. And in my favorite example for having these students start is we have a girl from Vietnam who is uh, employed here maybe 10 hours a week. And she, we saw her teaching another student how to use the 3D printers in Vietnamese. And that, you know, that made that student more comfortable to be able to, you know, interact in the language, their first language where they're most comfortable. So seeing that representation and having that, you know, experience where they were included was just so valuable. And it really made us feel like we were, you know, bringing it home and doing the, the principles like they're meant to be represented. Back to me. Thanks, Lori. I'm going to talk a little bit about campus partnerships and why they have been really beneficial for us. Number one, we have just increased our reach across campus with partnerships from a purely numbers perspective. Um, partnerships just expose many more students to our services. And it's also helped us bring in a diverse group of students, just not only for, for our staff, but in the students that use the space as well. We want our um, staff and our users of our space to represent our entire campus community. And some examples of uh, partnerships to that end are we've, we've worked a lot with the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion on campus and also programs such as the Louise Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, which goes by LSAMP. That's a kind of way easier thing to say. So I'll refer to them as LSAMP because I'm going to talk a little bit deeper about that in a second. But um, yeah, working with campus units that like already have established relationships with students really helps us build that trust and show that our space is welcoming to all students. A lot of times we will start a relationship with another campus unit just by reaching out. Uh, it helps if someone in our department already has a connection, but we've also cold emailed other departments that we think might be interested as well, kind of explaining what we do and offering a tour. And many times the person or office that we contact, they either didn't know there was a makerspace in the library or they've heard of us, but they've never been here. So by offering that tour, it kind of gives an entry point. It's an interesting thing that they might be, you know, they might want to come check out. And then we'll usually sit down afterwards and chat about partnerships. And I do a ton of tours, really, like like sometimes several a week. <laughs> um, and it's really great outreach. And because of this, we've developed this network of staff and faculty, what we like to call champions throughout campus. And it really, it's mutually beneficial because we can cross promote events. We can help connect each other to resources. We can collaborate together on events and projects and curriculum integrations, et cetera. And um, one recent example is I worked with the student counseling service. And also we have a how writing center that's located within the library, but they're a separate unit this semester. And we did some events called wellness Wednesdays and we combined the, uh, we would have a counselor from student counseling service come and talk about all of the resources for mental health available to students across campus. And then um, they would talk a little bit about the benefits of making uh, for your mental health, and then how Writing Center would have a writing prompt. So we do a little bit of journaling, and then that would lead into a maker exercise. And some examples are doing vision boards where you do a lot of collaging and multimedia, and also creating, using book binding to create a journal, and then usually using that to actually do your journaling. Um, so that was a great, you know, collaboration of three different departments that I think was pretty successful in um, providing a really fun entry point to students for, you know, getting access to mental health resources across campus. 
Uh, again, like Lori said, we've worked with the LSAMP program. And just for a little bit of background, they are, this is the quote from their website, um, a four-year scholars program with the purpose to significantly increase historically underrepresented minority student recruitment, retention, and attainment of STEM degrees from Miami University, um, subsequent graduate schools, and future entry into STEM careers. So that's their mission. The director of that program reached out to us last semester about having us participate in a big meeting that they were having. So we essentially set up a mini makerspace in one of the rooms of our Armstrong Student Center here at Miami. We did sticker making, virtual reality, and button making. And we saw about 75 LSAMP affiliated students that night. And it was great, you know, interaction. Students absolutely loved it. And it, it led to a lot of those students being regular users of the makerspace and then several of them actually applying for a job and getting hired at the makerspace, which has been great. Uh, so they're just a great way for us to achieve all of our goals that we're going after with the makerspace. Um, another partnership example is with our computer and electrical compute College of Engineering and Computing. I can never get that right. Uh, so we knew a lot of engineering students were already using the space, but we weren't officially affiliated with that department. So we kind of reached out and we ended up getting in touch with their K through 12 outreach coordinator, who was very excited about the maker space because she wanted to have us participate in the field trips that they do for K through 12 outreach. So we've done that. We've had, uh, field trips last semester and this semester of from middle school to high school coming in and doing maker activities. That's been really fun. And the hope there is that we'll inspire those younger students to explore maker and VR technologies and maybe, you know, potentially motivate them to come to Miami when it's time for them to go to college. But then Joanna, this is where it can kind of lead to unexpected places. Um, the K through 12 outreach coordinator, Joanna, she also happens to be on the committee to redesign a class ECE 101, which is a re required introductory course for first year ECE students. And across all sections, this class has roughly 400 students per semester. And because of our partnership with them, um, they're working to incorporate the makerspace into this course. And this both excites and terrifies us. Um, because it's such a large amount of students. But we've always said that is a good problem for us to have is trying to deal with a high demand like that. And um, part of that's part of why we received funding for a second Glowforge laser cutter. So we're just trying to address high volume um, that we expect in the 2022-2023 academic year. And that kind of leads me into uh, a big part of my job actually is maker literacy. So working with faculty across various courses to incorporate maker centered learning into their courses. And this helps us do several things. Number one, it helps us reach beyond just STEM, you know, the idea that it's just for STEM students. And um, it's really important to connect maker-centered learning to a wide variety of courses. And I believe that maker literacy is an incredible learning tool. It's not necessarily a subject to be learned, but it's a tool to learn whatever the uh, learning outcomes are of a course. And it can enhance learning in pretty much any area of study. So I apply maker literacy to a wide variety of disciplines. I made a little word cloud rather than me listing out all of the courses that I have collaborated with in the last few years. Um, but you can see it's definitely not just STEM. We have lots of humanities and um, yeah, there's lots of great, uh, I don't know, examples there. And I'll talk about a couple uh, specific examples. But um, by incorporating the makerspace into courses, we also help students kind of build deeper meaning with the space. You know, we help them connect the makerspace to their area of study and it helps them visualize how it connects to things that they're most passionate about and it creates excitement and really just helps bring more students into the folds of our maker community. And it also just extends our reach. We reach students who didn't know the makerspace existed. We reach students who um, did, but weren't sure if it was for them, which is a big part, part of that inclusivity principle. Um, we want to make sure that students all feel like they are makers and that they're welcome in the space. So um, and, you know, I try to pr provide engaging entry level activities and really work to help students feel not intimidated and feel like they're part of that community. 
A couple of quick examples I want to touch on. Uh, the first one is a Spanish and Portuguese class I worked with last semester. The title of the class is Short Forms of the Mexican Revolution, and they focus on the print and photography technology of the Mexican Revolution and then the impacts of that technology on politics of the time. And what I did for this class, I should have probably, whoops, go back one. I should have probably gotten a better picture of the printing press, but we 3D printed several printing, mini printing presses. And there's a project called the Open Press Project, and they have the um, 3D models of these freely available and instructions and everything. So we were able to actually make these mini 3D printed printing presses, and we used intaglio printing to allow students to carve out a design and actually try out the printing press themselves. And um, to make it a little bit more low cost, instead of using um, real metal plates, we use the inside of juice boxes because they have like an aluminum coating and the students can carve out a design. You put the ink on it and it only sticks to the place where you've carved it out and then run it through the press and it works really well. And we also 3D printed some block prints as well for students to try out. And then the eye picture here is an example of a halftone image that we cut on the laser cutter, engraved on the laser cutter. Halftone is a technique, it's an important technology, the late 19th, early 20th century that allowed for photographs to be printed in newspapers and essentially turns the photograph into a series of dots. So I taught the students how to do a halftone image in Illustrator and then we cut them out on the laser. It was a really fun session. It allowed students to kind of get really hands-on experience with these technologies, the historical technologies, rather than just reading about it in a book. You know, they were actually able to do it themselves, which gives them a whole new perspective. And then for their final project, they had to create their own um, short form. So create their own medium or media using various makerspace tools. Another example really quickly was a English 313 class, which was a technical writing class. In this class, students were tasked with researching an industry and creating a prototype for that industry. So in my session, I introduced them to the makerspace and gave a session on prototyping and design thinking, which is one of my kind of specialties that I like to um, present on. And so we held a rapid prototyping workshops workshop and then they prototype their own tabletop game. So there's a couple examples here. I, this one was probably my favorite. They made essentially hungry, hungry hippos using these supplies. So they get things like popsicle sticks, pipe cleaners, paper, tape, glue sticks, glass beads, just all the cheapest, you know, easy to find materials. And it, I'm always so impressed with students' creativity when you just give them, you know, raw materials and let them come up with things. And we did this session to help them not only gain those prototyping skills so they could make a prototype in the makerspace that semester, but it also just helps them stretch their creativity muscles and kind of feel more confident with um, creative choices in the prototyping process. And back to Elias. All right. Thanks, Sarah. So for the last, I don't know, five, seven minutes, uh, let's now talk about the role of leadership to further support innovation and experiential learning at our campuses. As we transition into a post-COVID environment, it is essential that we continue to adapt, prioritize, pilot, and implement services that address emerging and pressing needs. During COVID, we didn't have much time to develop a perfect plan. We had to deal with major decisions during times of high uncertainty. There was a real sense of urgency. We think one of the most important lessons from the pandemic is about how we were able to adapt and excel at what we did. Of course, it is also important to remain realistic with what we can do with what we have, our current staff capacity. So in times of unprecedented changes, there is no way we can do everything for everyone. So we need to find efficient ways to assess and build consensus regarding the type of services that are more impactful and beneficial for the students and faculty. So as much as we need to plan for the ideal scenario where we have all the resources, every position filled, it's important to keep a balance, a healthy balance between what's important and what we can realistically and efficiently do in the short term. 
This means that we also need to maximize the human potential with equity and efficiency. Advocate and provide the right professional development and mentoring opportunities. I think we can also do a bit more with student employees. As Lori has shared, student employees are responsible for 90% of all patron interactions in the makerspace. This is a win-win because they are empowered to work with their fellow students. And then Lori, Sarah, and the rest of the team, they have some more time to work with faculty on those high level engagement type of activities. Um, next slide, Sarah. And as Sarah mentioned a few minutes ago, we are lucky to have a good number of campus partners. We know that leadership is important in regard to building partnerships, relationships, and engagement. So this work involves identifying and establishing a group of campus and external allies that will help us advocate, champion, and show the value and impact of what we do. We all know that it is almost impossible that a single entity can succeed in life on their own, be it a person or, or an organization. We always need allies and partners. You know, one of my favorite books about this topic is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In that book, the author talks about the concept of interdependence. Others might summarize or refer to the idea of interdependence as teamwork, and that's okay too. At the end of the day, it is all about building synergy, working together to create something better than individual entities can create on their own. This semester, I am currently taking, I'm a student, I'm taking a class through EDUCAUSE. One of the modules is precisely about academic communication and partnerships. One of the readings is about cross-institutional collaboration. The instructors underline the value in being intentional to connect, engage, and collaborate with key stakeholders. So for us in higher ed, key stakeholders will include students, faculty, administrators, alumni, perhaps the corporate world. One of the value added benefits of effective collaboration and partnerships is the ability to find shared interest and common goals, which usually translate into efficiency and cost savings. Two years ago, as part of a leadership program, I conducted a number of informational interviews with library uh, leaders, assistant dean, associate deans. And when we talked about getting buy-in and support from academic units, almost all of them said, we just need to be more proactive in identifying academic collaborators early in the process. The big plans and priorities that we sent to the provost office should be seen as institutional priorities instead of library priorities. And we need to have a seat at the table. Our dean often says, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. And we don't want that. Another element of leadership, which might be kind of new to some of us, is the idea of corporate partnerships. In this day and age, when more companies are looking for community impact and benefits, I think academic libraries are in a unique position to act as incubators or hubs for innovation. So I think identifying corporate partners is something that will benefit our offerings and operations. Um, another book that I liked about uh, to refer to when I talk about our role in terms of building uh, partners and community uh, at our campuses is this uh, book, The Leadership Challenge. Many of us refer our actions and decisions based on their five practices. So model the way, inspire a shared vision, challenge the process, enable others to act, and encourage the heart. Uh, next and last slide, Sarah. So finally, let's now talk about money. <laughs> um, seriously, it's about developing sustainability uh, plans that will allow us to continue to assess and implement emerging and innovative services for the university community. The guiding principle for this priority is simple, meeting today's needs without compromising tomorrow's ones. So in times of limited resources, it is super important to plan for the financial future for our organizations especially when new initiatives get seed money. But then a, few, uh, a couple of weeks later, we get the question about equipment replacement. Right now, we are in the process of re-envisioning the future of 3D printing at Miami, in part because the old model is no longer in alignment with our priorities. 
So instead of replacing printers that cost 60 to 80,000, um, we'd rather invest 10, 15,000 in purchasing four, maybe six more basic and affordable printers that we can use to teach students how to 3D print. So instead of doing it for them, we teach and empower them to do it themselves. After all, that's part of the experiential learning philosophy. Another element of sustainability or healthy budgets, it's the idea of being creative in finding additional revenue sources. Getting external grants is definitely a plus. And finally, finally, working with the Office of Advancement can also help. In the short term, we could work with them and identify or revise current endowments that could give us some kind of flexibility in how we spend the funds that those endowments already generate. Actually, we're doing something like that at Miami. In the long term, it would be fantastic, a dream for many of us to create endowments for positions, for spaces, for programs, for research and development. So this is where working with the communication team will also be important as they will help us document and share the successes in what we do. And with that, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you. Looks like we have a couple of questions in chat. So uh, the first one is from uh, Shadia. Um, I hope I said your name right. Uh, and they say, this sounds like an awesome exercise in building trust with students. I think referring to the maker kits. Can you share more about how you cultivate that trust with students, checking out kits and using them? So really, I think it was a leap of faith on our part of <laughs> just saying, like, if we trust students, then they're going to they're they're going to rise to the challenge. And I think they have. They're really responsible with the equipment. We haven't had really much issues. We've had one thing go missing. Um, so I think with all that we've had checking out and back in, the students have just demonstrated to us that they are, you know, they're trustworthy and um, yeah, I think just extending that, that helping hand to them and saying, you know, go for it. I think that helps. Does any, anybody else have anything to say on that point? I would just add that we, we treated it like any kind of circulating item and, you know, in doing so, if they're, if it's late, there's, is fine and we can check it in, you know, up here in our own space and it has to come up here. So there's, you know, the responsibility of bringing it back to the original location, but, uh, for other, otherwise, it was just a circulating item and that, you know, with barcodes and everything, just like a book. So it, it we haven't really, like Sarah said, had many issues at all. And our library has a long history of checking out um, things. You know, we've we've had an Internet of Things here for quite a while <laughs> uh, or not Internet of Things, a library of things, um, you know, just microphones, laptops, things like that. So we were kind of just adding to the, the group there. All right, I see another question. Um, do you talk with students about Creative Commons or other types of licensing if they want to further share any of their creations? That's a great question. I have briefly touched on this in a lot of my instruction sessions that I do, but it's actually, I think that's a really great idea because our copyright and scholarly communications librarian is actually part of the Create and Innovate department here at Miami and is an amazing person and instructor. And um, so I don't know, that actually gives me an idea of maybe doing a joint session where I invite Carla in to really empower students to take ownership of their creations. So thanks for the idea, Jane. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in uh, fall 2019, we had some kind of big plans for how to integrate um, the notion of uh, open source um, KV Commons as part of the learning and making process. And, but, but again, I think we kind of blame COVID for this, right? We had to stop. But then also, as we reopened uh, last semester, uh, Carla got busy with other uh, library priorities. So we kind of, we didn't forget, but it's in the second type of priorities right now. So, but Jane, thanks so much. Yeah, that's very important um, because especially in this day and age, you know, they create something and then what? They're, they just, they, they can share it with anyone almost uh, right after they, 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 they finalize with their work. And so if we're not careful with that, yes, that's, <laughs> we, we don't want to be in that kind of trouble either. So thanks. All right. And then um, I think we're, we have a five minute warning. So <laughs> thank you, Ben. 
Uh, Jane also said that if we're at Ohio State, we might want to check out instructor resources at university libraries. It's not a makerspace, but does provide resources aimed at helping instructors teach using library. Okay, cool. Thank you for that resource as well, Jane. Uh, do we have any other questions? You can put them in chat or if anybody would like to unmute and ask questions, we are open to that. Ask now. <laughs> Also, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat. Um, if anybody has further like questions, comments, anything like that, or if you happen to be in the Oxford area driving through and you want to come by and have a tour of the space, uh, you know, everybody's semi, well, a lot of, a lot of people I think are semi local like with this conference, right? So even if you're not, if you're near uh, Southwest Ohio, definitely come by. We'll and just thank open you so much, everyone, for your participation today.